Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for logging on today and welcome to our PAM Town Hall Forum for the month of June. I'm your host, Andrew Perkins. Today, our topic is introducing the 55.1 Call to Worship Lectionary Aids for Year C. Our panelists today are the Reverend Dr. Kimberly Bracken Long, editor of the Call to Worship Journal, and Reverend Kimberly Adams, a member of the PAM Executive Board and pastor at First Presbyterian Church of Valparaiso, Indiana. There will be a time for questions at the end of today's presentation. You may submit your questions to the panelists via the chat. And now, please welcome our panelists, Kim and Kim. Good afternoon. Okay. Welcome to the June Town Hall meeting. As Andrew said, my name is Kim Adams and I am the pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Valparaiso, Indiana and PAM board member. Today we welcome Kim Long, editor for The Call to Worship, and she is here with us today to introduce the 2021-2022 Call to Worship Lectionary Aids and Journal. Good afternoon, Kim. Hi, good to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks for being with us today and for sharing your time and your gifts. So let's go ahead and get started with some questions that we have already prepared. <laughs> I was so excited last week to receive the new lectionary aids in the mail and I noticed that there are some new features. What can you tell us about them? What new features are included in this year's lectionary aids issue? I'm excited about the new stuff that um, is part of this issue. Um, one of them, first of all, it's it's a beautiful one. Love the photograph that's courtesy of Austin Seminary. Um, one of the most important features we've added is suggestions every week for art, visual art that relates to the lectionary readings for the day. Uh, Sandra McDonald, who uh, served in this capacity for Central Presbyterian Church in Atlanta for years, finding just stunning art, visual art, um, usually for use on the front of the worship order, has a lot of experience with um, searching for images, for understanding what the copyright issues are, if there are copyright issues and some good sources. So she's listed three or four possible images for use in worship. You could use them on your worship order. You could um, <clears throat> you know, project them in the sanctuary if you use screens. Um, you could make them visible in another way. You could people links if you want them to um, contemplate them before or after worship service. So um, she does also include, you know, in the very front, there's this um, in introductory section. If you're like me, like you usually don't read the introductory stuff. You sort of like, just take me to the date where I need to get what I need to get. But there's actually some good stuff in the intro. And um, most of the contributors, if not all of them, have um, provided these, you know, short bits about how they approach their work. And um, Sandra's introdu introduction includes information about um, the kinds of sources that she uses. Things like um, icons, which is spelled E-Y-E-K-O-N-S dot com. Um, Jan, Richard Jan Richardson's work, which um, some of you may already be aware of, as well as um, um, those, those do require either a subscription or a fee um, or um, the, what do you call it? Public domain, I guess. The images that are in public domain or that have, um, you know, the artist has given permission to use them for free. And a lot of those you can find um, on the Vanderbilt University sponsored um, lectionary site. And I believe uh, Andrew's going to share his screen so we can take, um, yes, thank you, Philip. Art in the Christian Tradition, Vanderbilt Library. So if you just even put Google, you, you may know, know about this site already, but even if you put the uh, lectionary <laughs> into Google, this is likely to come up uh, at the top or near the top. So as you can see, um, Andrew did that and now he has um, gone to the Sunday that just come up for next Sunday and clicked on art. And there you can see not one, not two, but three pages. <laughs> 
of um, different kinds of artistic renderings, some contemporary, some um, classic, some are sculptures, some are stained glass, some are drawings, some are paintings. So there's a really wide variety of sources for you to take advantage of. And um, Sandra is uh, now our um, guide to choosing um, art for each Sunday so that you don't have to do all the work all by yourself. And I'm pleased to say that she's already agreed to do that for next year's lectionary aids issue as well. That's wonderful. Yeah, I have more new things though. Thank you, Andrew, that's good. Um, there are a couple of other things that are new this year. Um, Philip Morgan had the brilliant idea of, of including vocal solos for the summer months when some churches don't have choirs that are meeting. So uh, he has compiled a list of suggestions for that for the summer. And we thought it was such a good idea that in next year's issue, we're gonna continue that and they're actually expanding that to include um, vocal solos for all of the seasons of the church year. So I think that's a great addition. Um, we have a couple of new things in, in the, on the liturgical side as well. Um, one of my favorite things that we've done is instead of having um, just a prayer of confession every week, now we have the entire confession sequence. So there's a call to confession, a prayer of confession, and then a declaration of forgiveness that are all construed as, as a unit, um, you know, as a, a, all of a piece so that you'll have um, this thematic continuity from um, the beginning to the end of that confession part and sequence. And I, I think that's a really valuable addition. And finally, um, we've been using um, or are providing seasonal liturgies every year um, and kind of a, um, you know, repeating those from year to year. And these are the things that you can use, say, a prayer for every Sunday in the season of Advent or every Sunday in the season of Lent. And this year we've added to the number of choices that we have in that category. So those are all the brand new things for this year. That's really exciting. And I know a great help for me and I'm sure many others as well. Um, so. so thank you. And thank you to all the contributors who, who work, who put the time and effort and love into offering, creating, creating um, the lectionary aids. Absolutely. But I know that's the, what's so fun about this too, is that not only do we have these great co contributors who are such experts in their fields, but they often don't, only, don't just do the assignment that they've been given or that they've you know, um, agreed to do, but they also in the process are generating new ideas all the time. And it's that kind of um, you know, creative energy and um, integration with one another's work that keeps making up this re worship resource better and better all the time, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Certainly giving room for the Holy Spirit and Amen. that help with that creative work. So yeah. Amen. So I noticed there's been some other recent changes to the resource as well. Um, could you explain why you made them? Yeah, there are some things that we've been doing for a couple of years now that it occurred to me, maybe people have been wondering about. Um, maybe the one that um, has been most obvious is the change in what we used to call the hymn grid. And we used to have that chart with, you know, X number of hymnals across the top and then, you know, where they, um, where a particular hymn could be found. And um, Josh Taylor, who's done the, um, provided the hymn contribution. I should try to train myself to stop just saying hymns because we were to do the song, congregational song contributions because it's wider than only hymns. Um, realized after he did the first year that he was spending a lot of time just sort of checking the boxes and that he was also not able to include um, songs and hymns from other sources that weren't listed you know, in that hymn grid. So we thought, um, let's give it a try. And we, we think that if we change the formatting to away from um, a set grid of hymn, hymnals and use the same kind of formatting that we use for the other sections, that way we could um, do a couple of things. We could just 
provide the numbers for pre the Presbyterian Hymnal and Glory to God. Mm -hmm. And then we could send people to hymnary.org, which you all know is a great resource to see um, if those particular hymns and songs occur in the collections that you might be using in your church if it's not Presbyterian. And um, finally, and perhaps most important is um, now we can list let's say a, a new hymn by David Yorland who's just come that's just come out in a collection of his from GIA or a new hymn by David Gambrell that's just come out um, a new hymn by Mel Bringle I mean people are writing all the time and also um, perhaps lesser known composers that um, are just beginning to be known to us so I think that change is giving us a lot more flexibility and able to introduce us to a lot more, a lot more music. One of the other things we did, um, thanks to John Sal, we've been kind of struggling from year to year about exactly how to um, provide resources for churches that had instrumental ensembles. And as the years went on, we realized we couldn't just think about those larger churches that had an orchestra or like a string group or wind group. And that what would maybe be more helpful would be to provide some general guidelines rather than try to guess, you know, what instruments a particular church had. So um, beginning with last year's lectionary AIDS issue, um, we have included some really um, thoughtful wisdom from John Sal about how to approach choosing instrumental music for your church. And we plan to continue to provide that. Um, a couple other changes we made, we moved, um, we used to have it's been if you're a long time subscriber you know we've had different iterations for anthems sometimes it's been smaller choirs and larger choirs sometimes for adult and youth and children for the weekly contributions and this time or last year or the, maybe the year before we decided you know youth choirs and children's choirs in most churches um, don't sing every week oh. so it might be more helpful to provide seasonal resources for those groups uh, and to suggest repertoire that can be used anytime, you know, during a particular season or the season after Pentecost. Um, we also included piano music in those seasonal sections as well, uh, which is something that we hadn't always done. And finally, if, um, you know, if you are one of those people that reads the introductions and all the fine print, you might have noticed that um, we have been blessed to have Martin Tell do an entire three-year cycle of psalmody uh, suggestions for us. And what he did was actually not just provide suggestions, but provide a really comprehensive list of um, metrical and responsorial psalms for every Sunday in the church year. So we are blessed to be able to continue to use that and um, you know, he was on the editorial board for Santo, Santo, Santo. Um, and so somewhere along the line, he was able to incorporate those into his own suggestions. But I think for the first year, we, uh, Philip actually, Morgan actually went back and added anything from Santo, Santo, Santo that was a psalm um, to just update Martin's suggestions a little bit more. Um, so I just feel like Martin gave us a tremendous gift um, because he's been so knowledgeable and so involved in the publication of Psalmody um, in the last couple of decades. So to have that um, resource come straight from him has been a great gift. And I just wanted people to know that, um, that that's where that all comes from. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And that is, that is a tremendous gift for, for the church. So... Um, lots of exciting, exciting things um, for for congregations to be able to implement um, into their worship hours and um, and special services, seasonal worship. So, wow, so exciting. Um, I understand that you're planning three topical issues for this coming year as well for the journal. Mm -hmm. What themes will the journal be exploring? I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about what's coming up um, for the topical issues for this year. 
And I wanted to take some time to mention them um, so that maybe I can pique your interest ahead of time to sort of watch for what's coming out and maybe anticipate ways that you might be able to make use of these um, issues in your churches. Uh, the next issue that's coming out it will come out in August and its title is Dismantling Racism in Worship. So if you are a Matthew 25 congregation, that might be especially um, interesting to you. Uh, and even if you're not a Matthew 25 congregation, I, I hope it's interesting to you. And if it's not, I'll, I guess, challenge you to make it interesting to you. Um, one of the things that I think Pam members will especially appreciate is that there's um, quite, a, quite a bit of emphasis on music there. And three of our authors will also be presenting town halls in the fall. And you'll wanna take, take part of them. Um, Carlton Johnson is writing about um, I, what I would call heart songs, you know, of the Black church, songs that have been um, central to the experience of Black worshipers that may be, you know, similar to um, how white churches have, um, predominantly white churches have experienced those songs and hymns, and also how um, how those traditions can be different, how the same hymn can um, resonate uh, differently in practice and in the meaning and in the sort of life experiences to which those songs are attached. So Carlton's done some fantastic work. You're gonna really wanna read his article and I know that you're gonna wanna engage him in conversation in the fall. Uh, Tony McNeil has um, written an exploration of what's sometimes called the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. And um, I don't know about some of you, but my hunch is that your experience has been similar to mine where I have a, a lifelong Presbyterian. I, um, that might not be similar, but what I'm getting ready to say might be similar. Um, where probably Black History Month or Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, um, where a congregation predominantly white will consider li singing, lift every voice and sing and wonder if they should, um, if they could, um, and if they do, um, what should they know? How should they approach it? How should they be singing it? And um, Tony has written a really thoughtful, really helpful, um, honest, gracious, generous essay um, on lift every voice and sing. And just as with Carlton, you're gonna to wanna to read it and you're gonna to wanna to talk to him in the fall. And finally, our own Philip Morgan is writing an article on, or has written an article on, um, I should probably just ask him to talk about it because I think he's here. <laughs> Essentially, this is probably not exactly how he would say it, but you know, being both black and Presbyterian, um, what that's like, what happens, what's happened in his experience. Again, it's um, a really honest and vulnerable sharing of experience from which um, the rest of us can really deepen our understanding and be active participants in dismantling racism. Um, as he says, not just um, when we leave the church to go out to the world, but in what we actually are doing in the worship service, how what we how what we do together when we gather together on Sunday morning or whenever we gather um, can actually be part of that work. Um, you know, from other articles that Philip has written, that um, he's uh, wise beyond his years and thoughtful and articulate, eloquent, and um, he's this piece is the same as all the others, just really really fine work. And he will also join us for a town hall in the fall. Oh, that's great. It will be great. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have two more to tell you about. Okay. Um, the February issue, which will be 55.3, is called New Topics in Music. And, um, <laughs> and um, some of the things I think will especially, well, I think the whole issue will be interesting to PAM members, but um, one that I thought I'd highlight, uh, Paul Basile is writing on paperless songs. Yeah. Um, they're 
are uh, kind of there's several articles that I would put under the umbrella of um, exploring various styles and traditions of music. Um, Ike Storm, who is a jazz musician and church musician in New York City, is um, writing an, an article on, this is my language, not his, but I think it's such an interesting idea and something the black church has done always, but how, how how music can create a, what, what I call a liturgical soundscape. It's not just background music. And it's not just, you know, here's a hymn for this slot and here's a hymn for this slot and here's a hymn for this slot. But the, the um, integration of music into the liturgical action and how you do that and, and what that means. And um, something that's really exciting about that is we're working with Andrew Perkins to make it possible for Ike to accompany his article with some sound clips, which will be posted on the PAM website so that he can actually let you hear what he's writing about. And we're hoping that this might be sort of a portal into some things that we might be able to do in the future that will be more multimedia. And finally, in that issue, you might be particularly interested, we're gonna have reviews, um, substantive reviews, um, on, the, on three new hymnals that have just come out, the Mennonite hymnal, Voices Together, um, Santo, 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 Spanish language hymnal, and um, One Lord, One Faith, One Baptism, um, African-American collection of congregational song, also from TIA. Finally, <laughs> on 55.4, will come out in February of 2022, and that issue will focus on reconciliation. Um, Lim Sui Hong, a composer and musician that many of you know, uh, either personally or by reputation, will, uh, is, will be writing on singing toward reconciliation. Um, and I'm really eager to hear what Sui Hong does with that. A young South African scholar, um, Mountain Lobsher, whom I met a couple of years ago, has been really interested in his own context in talking about how the Belhar Confession, what implications Belhar has on liturgy. And when I asked if he would be willing to write on it for us, he just jumped at the chance um, because he's doing that in South Africa as well and really feels strongly about it. So I think we're really gonna learn a lot from him. Um, Martha Morkish, who's near and dear to many of us, will be writing on confession. Um, we do it all the time, and sometimes we kind of forget why we do it. So she will be more um, thoughtful, wise guide and leader in that. Another fan favorite, Slats Tool, is going to be writing about um, healing the wounds inflicted upon LGBTQ plus worshipers. And I know that we will learn from her. Turgical nerds out there will uh, three cheers for another article from Gail Ramshaw, who will be writing about passing the peace. And a uh, young Lutheran scholar, Leah Shade, is going to be writing about preaching across political divides, which is a topic that I don't think is going to go away anytime soon. So I'm really excited about the um, how the topical issues are a combination of issues and challenges and questions of you know life in contemporary North America mm -hmm. and also at the same time um, opportunities to continue to um, broaden and deepen our understanding of what it means to be a Christian in the reformed tradition and what um, faithful and um, vital worship looks like for us. Yeah, absolutely. So much, so many, it sounds like a lot of resources will be available for those um, Presbyterian churches who have signed up to and committed to be a Matthew 25 congregation, as well as other denominations who are committed to that work of dismantling uh, structural racism and... Um, absolutely. Yeah, and it... And it one of the things that's really important to me when I'm um, looking for contributors is um, that we're drawing from, we're hearing from ecumenical voices too, that we're not, 
we're not just a like a, an insulated little cult <laughs> where we only talk to and for each other, but we are really paying attention to um, what people in other traditions, um, we've had Roman Catholic authors, we've had uh, really authors from across the spectrum from, you know, more free church to more, you know, what, you know, sort of liturgical churches, if you want to use that language. Um, and, and I think that's, that's another form of diversity that's really important for us to pay attention to in addition to matters of, um, you know, tradition and race and culture and, um, and sexuality. Absolutely. And, you know, the Belhar confession is just, it ties it all in. So that's, that'll be exciting when that issue comes out for, for many of yeah. us. Especially to hear from someone, you know, who's living and working and worshiping in the context from right. which Belhar grew. That's, I'm really excited about that. Exactly. I know in my um, current circumstance, um, um, the volume on spaces for worship from, I think it was 2019, um, has been a helpful resource for the congregation I'm currently serving, um, who are considering updates to the sanctuary um, and things that they've never really considered before as they continue the discussion on intentionality, on theological significance. So I wanna thank you, Kim, um, for, for your work with this. We have so much to look forward to over this next year. And it's exciting that um, Call to Worship can help uh, communities um, begin conversations or, you know, no matter, or if they're already in conversation, how can they, um, how these topics can help to open up our perspectives a little bit. So thank you very much. Um, mm. Thank you for telling me about what your church is doing. I'm always glad to hear, hear those stories that, 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 that the work that we're doing, you know, has some ripple effects. Absolutely. So um, I guess now would be a good time to ask if, if there's anybody who would like to share how their churches have used the topical issues, how, how they impacted their community. Um, and I guess to use the chat, um, is that what Andrew had suggested, suggested, I think? I think, yeah, if there are people who, um, I know I always, you know, think I have all these great ideas and then I, you know, talk to other people and get a whole bunch of other great ideas that I never thought of. So I'm always interested to see see to hear how um how people might use these not just the worship planning resource the lectionary aids issue but the other topical issues either i mean i've heard of people say they use them in their staff you know among the staff for sure um sometimes in worship committees um sometimes a, you know to study a particular article with the session um so I thought it, this might be a good opportunity to give other people a chance to um, share any stories or uh, ideas about how they've used call to worship in their churches that somebody else might benefit from. So to, so to start off on a high note, I can read a, a, a comment from David Iker, who says, so much wonderful material for planning and discussion. Thanks to Kim and the entire PAM board for these amazing contributions to the church. Thanks for that, David. It's a good opportunity for me to give a shout out to the PAM board, um, which has taken, um, in it, with their last um, sort of committee restructuring, um, the Educational Resources Committee has played a huge role in um, advising me and taking responsibility for, um, especially the lectionary AIDS issue. Um, there, I mean, it's just, I can't, I can't, um, what's that word I want? It means quantify, <laughs> something the numbers. <laughs> I, can't, I can't quantify. Um, how much of a difference that's made. And I'm just really grateful for the board as a whole, and especially for those who have 
served on that educational resources committee. They've done great work and continue to. And we're certainly grateful for you, Kim. We're also, you know, if people don't have any of those, those particular kinds of stories to share, um, maybe we'll just plant a seed and say, there are ways that you can use those issues that might uh, generate generate something new in your congregation or, or a new way of doing something um, that you've always done before. Um, I'd also be interested in, uh, not to take over the monitorial role from Kim, <laughs> I'd also be interested, um, since I have a chance to hear from people directly, um, if there are things of, um, you know, suggestions, things you'd like to see, things you think aren't working very well, um, ideas you have that perhaps we haven't thought of, um, or any questions that you might have about what we're doing or, or decisions that we've made or um, whether we're thinking, whether we've got something on our radar. See some, see some things are popping up. I'll ask Andrew to. Sure, we, we can start with, uh, with Philip's suggestion to, to talk more about the work of our hands articles uh, because lots of hand members often coordinate such art projects at their churches. Mm. Yeah, so the, the work of our hands feature is the, I guess I shouldn't really say centerfold. It's like the middle, like the middle color part um, of the journal where we've got um, often, Often it's the work of um, particular liturgical artists. And often, actually the way it started was to highlight um, the work of congregations who are, who are creating art for liturgy um, themselves. Sometimes they've got their own ideas and sometimes they've got um, some outside um, leadership. So it's been exciting to me to watch I think, I've, I think we've seen a real difference in the last few years um, in how churches are um, imagining visual art to be part of their worship practices. Um, whether it's, you know, providing a, a piece for contemplation in the worship, if there's a printed worship order, or, um, you know, preachers using, um, what some of, some of us sometimes call visual exegesis, you know, where preachers will use a, a work of art. I mean, John August Swanson is a great example, someone who um, creates works of art in biblical themes, um, where preachers use works of art to help interpret, you know, right alongside a commentary or um, some other scholarly writing to say, hmm, this is, this is what this artist has, has heard and seen in this um, passage of scripture and how might it impact our own our own understanding. Um, one of the things, the features I thought was really fascinating came out during uh, recently and it was um, the Heightstown Church, Presbyterian Church, who took their liturgical art outside because it was during a pandemic and some of you may remember, we were not the only ones that covered it, some um, that really stunning orange, yellow, red, Pentecost material <laughs> flowing from the top window, you know, of the outside of the church where people all through the community saw it and could interact with the prayer cross that was at the foot of it. And um, I think reading and actual, actually seeing photographs of the, reading about and seeing photographs of the work that churches and individual artists do can be great priming of the pump for um, that kind of, um, not just to, I say this a lot, but not just to sort of spice up our worship, but, you know, worship is embodied. It's sacramental. Um, people talk about uh, intergenerational worship sometimes. And I always say, if we're, if we're really attending to all of the 
the, the, this embodied sensuality, if you will, of worship, our worship is automatically going to be intergenerational. I mean, it's, um, you know, color, color is a color and form and texture. Um, so those of you who know, I've, you know, become a weaver in the last couple of years. I'm astonished even more about how color and form and texture can be expressions of prayer. Um, so I think I know there are people who've always known that. And, Dave, uh, Dave Van, um, our former president, um, Pam, Board, mm -hmm. or Pam president, um, Dave Vandermeer, um, has done a lot of work on worshiping with the sen senses, right? And, um, you know, we've we've been given the gift of smell and touch and sight and um, hearing and and to be able to use those senses in a way, a holistic way to worship and art definitely invites is inviting for us. Yeah, yeah it is. It is, and it's an especially in churches where people come together to to create art. Um, you know that it's a it's a communal form of prayer as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah, Dave Vandermeer. I have to say a little shout out. You know, I think he's he is one of uh, two or three uh, people in my life who really um, kind of uh, awakened me to the power of art, um, mm -hmm. and has been a, a valued conversation partner all along absolutely so to go a little bit different direction there's a suggestion here uh says could there be a way that the issue on systemic racism be shared with all matthew 25 congregations it could be a, a way to spread the great work of pam with some congregations that may not be aware of this resource that's a great idea i'll find out um, I know that I've been continually, um, uh, I, I meet with the uh, staff of, the, of theology and worship, and so I hear when um, there are Matthew 25 related initiatives going on, and when they're asking for resources and, you know, get, tell us what your office is doing that is connected to these Matthew 25 initiatives. So. Um, I have been sharing the fact that we are doing those things, but we have not looked into the possibility of sharing the entire issue. Um, and I think I, not only as, I don't know what, who said that, sounds like a Kelly Abraham thing, but if, oh, it was David Eicher. Well, another, uh, another part of the brain trust. Um, he's, that, that would be great for Pam and great, great for the church. So thanks for that suggestion. You guys know everything you think you need to know? Are there any any more questions or ideas that um, folks would like to share? I'll make a plea. Uh, oh, let's see, no, I'm curious. So this one uh, uh, comes from Sandra McDonald who says uh, one could possibly argue that worship planners probably lean, probably lean more toward being more verbal and word and speech focused. But surely many worshipers are more visual kinesthetic. Yeah, that's a really insightful observation. I think you're right, Sandra. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've been curious about, um, when David Benambra was editing um, uh, Call to Worship, he started 
And uh, we, he started several new features and one of them was this ideas section. And um, most of the time we've used that section to share newly written uh, hymn texts uh, or, or hymns uh, or newly written prayers. And um, I think that would also be a great, I could also imagine somebody Let's say Sandra McDonald had a, um, a story to share about how the point that she just made about m many worshipers being visual and kinesthetic, um, how one church might have uh, done incorporated some practice into their worship to take that into account. Um, even just a little, even it was a three or four paragraphs about what that was and why they did it, I think that would be a great thing to include in an idea section. So just sort of put it out there that um, if, if there's something you've done in your church that you think other churches would really benefit from and um, we've got that place where you could share that story. So please send them along to me. I would love to hear them and love to share them. So Carol Pye, um, says, S, do you have any suggestions as to how artists in the congregation can best coordinate their vision with the pastors planning worship? Ooh, let's see. That's a really good question, Carol. Um, not surprised you asked a really good question. Um, you're, you're, um, reminding me of when I was, um, I was worshiping at Central Presbyterian in Atlanta when I was teaching at Columbia. And I can't remember if I was a member of the worship committee or if I was meeting with the worship committee. And it was right at the beginning when Dave was getting folks at Central to start talking about art. And um, there were several pro professional artists in the congregation and one of them, her name was Ann, was there. And I said, naively, I can't think, I can't imagine why anybody would be against art. I mean, like, why wouldn't you want to in include, you know, beauty? Or it, she just looked at me like, have you been living under a rock? And I mean, she was not unkind, but <laughs> I felt like I'd been living under a rock when she said, art can be very controversial. Uh, sometimes art makes people angry. It doesn't always just make them feel good. And I thought, well, yeah, of course, she's right about that. So it was a little, it was a wake up. I wasn't the pastor of that church, but, you know, I was, you know, I have been a pastor and I was kind of in that sort of role, I suppose. And it, it made me realize how, um, how little I knew about artists and um, about how they think and what they think about and what they can contribute. So it seems to me that um, art that worship, if you've got a, a church that has a, a committee structure, not all committees, not all churches do, but if there is a worship committee, um, you know, incorporating artists to be in the worship committee that hopefully, you know, is part of the planning, at least in a tangential way, seems to me like a first step. Um, it, I realized that um, I realized how tricky it is that, you know, you uh, one single artist can't necessarily go and impose her or his or their will on a church or or a pastor. So I guess I would say uh, the more the more artists can work in collaboration with others, um, I imagine the more successful the efforts would be. Absolutely. And I would say, um, just since I'm currently serving in that role for pastors, to be able to invite the artist in and to talk, to dream together, to, um, of course, be in worship team, but to see what can be coordinated for in worship planning. Um, 
in the in the days ahead. It can be life giving for a congregation, especially if they're new to um, experiencing art and worship. Uh, Philip Morgan says, Kim, tell everyone about art and faith and the theology of making. Um, thank you, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I have been raving to Philip about this book that um, I'm pulling it up on Amazon so I get the title exactly right. It's Art and Faith, a, the colon, a Theology of Making by Makoto Fujimura. Uh, Makoto Fujimura is a Japanese artist. Maybe, I, I don't know if his citizenship is technically Japanese American. He was until recently, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, <clears throat> director of the Brain Center for the Arts at um, Fuller, but I, I believe he's left that position. He has, he has written this astonishing book. It's not his first book, but it's the first book of his that I've read, Art and Faith. And he has this, I told Philip I had been reading the first, I told him you need to read this book. I told several people this. I've read the first 50 pages and then I started over so that I could start making notes. And um, it talks about how creating, and this doesn't have to be just visual art, but visual art, music, writing, preaching, whatever your mode of expression is, you know, that creating is an inherent part of being um, part of God's creation that um, in fact, it, to, to make, to be, to, that the art of making is inherently, inherently human. And, and he would, I think even say, at least for him and for many Christians, even an essential part of the way we pray. Um, oh. I wish I had prepared to talk about that because um, I, I, grabbed, I picked up that book the other night and Tom and I were sitting in the living room and I was like, can I read you something? And I was you know, reading page after page after page to him and he was jumping out of his chair and um, it was exciting to him for different reasons than it was exciting to me. So I, um, uh, I recommend the book to anybody. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Kim. And thank you, Philip, for that suggestion. Um, Sandra McDonald said, even if there aren't professional artists in the church, a planning group can ask, what could we do that would be visual? How could we incorporate color and image? <clears throat> exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, the whole professionalism has been has become a problem for us in the church, hasn't it? Whether it's music or whether it's art or whether it's how we think of um, church leaders. Uh, uh -huh. So, yeah, thank you for a, that. Yeah, it can be a stumbling block for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, thank you, Sandra. Philip says, if we are created in the image of the creator, we are made to create. I think it might help to spark a conversation with pastors. Absolutely, Philip. Uh, uh, that's what he thought I would say. That's what you were trying to get me to say in response to Carol. Thank you. You should. I wish you had just said that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the director of Christian education on the community where I serve likes to likes to say that we are co-creators with God. Um, and um, that inspires him to do his work and his art with um, and how it is how it plays out in Christian education. So yeah, thank you, Philip. All right, so is this the time now that we turn it over to Andrew? Absolutely, you can turn it over to me. And uh, on behalf of Pam, we'd like to thank you both for a wonderful discussion. 
Uh, I would be uh, remiss if I did not remind everyone watching about the worship and music conferences at Montreat. So whether you joining us or whether you will be joining us in person or online, you're in for a fantastic experience. If you've already registered, make sure to invite friends to join you. There is room. There is room in person and there's uh, there's an infinite amount of room online, whichever way you'd like to join. But you can learn more about our conference by visiting www.presbymusic.org 2021 conference. Additionally, you can watch the recording of this town hall and all of our other town halls and check out our upcoming schedule at presbymusic.org town dash hall. For the Presbyterian Association of Musicians, I'm Andrew Perkins. Thanks again for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.